Good afternoon. My name is Dana Goldman. I'm the director of the Schaefer Center, and I'm really pleased you could join us for today's webinar on making progress in cancer diagnostics, clinical practice, and policy. Our program is co-hosted today by the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics and the Health Society and Medicine Program of the Aspen Institute. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Ruth Katz. Thanks, Dana. And it's really terrific to be partnering with you and your team again. And welcome everybody in the audience. We're delighted to have you join us for what truly is a very exciting and very special program. Cancer is, of course, a topic of critical importance and great interest to virtually everyone, as it should be. Although we've made extraordinary progress in cancer prevention, such as declining rates in smoking and cancer treatments, particularly for late stage cancers, cancer remains the second leading cause of death in the United States. Indeed, this year alone, we estimate 600,000 Americans will die of various forms of the disease. But new tools for early detection of many cancers may well be on the way, along with the promise to significantly reduce cancer mortality rates. The purpose of today's program is to learn more about these innovations and to address the attendant policy issues, including questions of access. Like so much in healthcare, as we all know, one zip code or skin color can stand as the greatest predictor of the outcome of a cancer diagnosis. We need to ensure that all new and effective diagnostics that can impact these outcomes are available to everyone. Thanks, Ruth. And, and I'll just add to that, in addition to the disparity issues that you've raised, there are also some salient policy developments recently that make this a very timely activity. The first is COVID, of course, has underscored the importance of diagnostics in population health generally. And maybe this has been an area that we've uh, missed to our detriment uh, in policy circles recently. But the second and uh, relevant issue is that uh, I think it was last week uh, or certainly this month, uh, several, uh, a bipartisan group of representatives introduced the Multi-Cancer Early Detection Screening Coverage Act uh, in the House. And the idea here is to ensure timely Medicare coverage for these types of diagnostics and perhaps to avoid some of the mistakes that I mentioned with COVID. The challenge, of course, is how do you pay for these things and how do you deliver the value and make sure you're reimbursing appropriately? And these are all issues that we're going to get into as we go through uh, today's program. So uh, with that in mind, uh, uh, I just will first have a clinical outlook panel led by Dr. Howard Skip Burris, who's president and medical officer of Sarah Cannon and board chair of the American Society of Cl Clinical Oncology, along with a distinguished panel of experts that I believe he'll introduce. And then this clinical discussion will be followed by a policy discussion looking at the value of early detection, payment models, and access issues. Uh, one housekeeping note, if you have questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A button that's in the Zoom um, app and it will be sent to the moderators for each panel. Ruth? Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Azaraza, who is presenting today's keynote, 21st Century Tools to Stop Cancer Early and Often. Dr. Raza is the Chan Sun Chung Professor of Medicine and Director of the Myelodysplastic Syndrome Center at Columbia University, where she is a practicing oncologist and also directs a cancer research lab. She worked with President-elect Joe Biden on his Cancer Moonshot Initiative, and in her spare time, Dr. Raza is an author. Among other publications, she has penned the highly acclaimed book, The First Cell and the Human Cost of Pursuing Cancer to the Last, which one oncologist reviewer described as, and I quote, a far reaching book that will change the conversation around cancer for decades to come. Dr. Raza, welcome and thank you for taking time from your incredibly busy schedule to join us today. We so appreciate the time. The Zoom stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Ruth, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Dana and Kukla, and uh, to the Aspen Center. 
and USC for giving me this opportunity. Um, as you uh, said, I am uh, basically uh, first and foremost a clinician. So I'm going to begin my talk uh, by sharing my screen and starting right up as a clinician. I came to the United States in 1977 and I started treating acute myeloid leukemia with two drugs popularly known as 7 and 3. Today, I'm still treating AML with 7 and 3. Oh no, there's a new form, which is a liposomal form that improves survival by 3.8 months at the cost of $40,000 compared to $4,000. But what if I had AML today? After all these years and treating thousands of patients, you know, I would take the same treatment. Here's an example of a young lady, Lina Anwar. Her parents, like me, came from Pakistan and settled in LA. At 28 years of age, Lina, who was born and raised in LA, got a coveted job at the LA Times as a journalist. At 29, she got acute myeloid leukemia. What did we offer her? We offered her seven and three. Her only chance of long-term survival was a bone marrow transplant, but she couldn't find a match. So a haplotransplant at City of Hope was given from her brother. She relapsed in six months, got a second haplotransplant and died a tormented death at 29 years of age. Just in April of this year, we failed Lina. I can't tell you the number of evenings I spent walking back and forth on my terrace, talking to her tortured family. How is it that after all these years, this is all we are offering? So death by leukemia is a local, not an express. Same run, a few more stops. That's medicine, the art of prolonging disease. Fits line up perfectly, except it was written in 1961 by Peter DeRees in his lovely novel called uh, Blood of the Lamb, which is based loosely on his own personal story of losing his 10-year-old to leukemia. In this 12-year period, 72 new anti-cancer drugs were introduced. They prolonged survival by 2.1 months. In fact, 70% of the drugs we approve today in the last two decades have shown zero improvement in survival. 95% clinical trials fail today and 5% that succeeds should have failed probably because they're only improving survival for a fraction of patients for a short few months. Yes, we are curing 68% of cancers today, but with what? The same treatment. So what has a quarter of a trillion dollars in research gotten us? Well, cancer is certainly a complicated disease. It begins in one cell. And as its um, cell divides, I mean, we think of hereditary factors or pathogens or exposure to toxins, but most uh, of the time we have no idea why somebody got cancer. And one of the possible explanations is a random DNA copying error that leads to a mutation. So let's say a normal cell retains a mutation, gives it a growth advantage, it undergoes clonal expansion, the problem is every time the cell divides, it can pick up new mutations. And so by the time we actually find clinically apparent cancer, there are thousands and thousands of uh, things that have gone wrong. And there are multiple clones with different mutations and different uh, metabolic pathways possible. So the issue is that we are trying to face this tremendous complexity of cancer with a reductionist conceit for so many years. One uh, mutation, um, one protein abnormal, one magic bullet for each cancer. Sure, it worked for CML and APL, but uh, now we have a real problem in that uh, by the time most cancers are diagnosed, there are way too many mutations that have happened and too much else that has gone wrong. Just to help you grasp the complexity of a cancer um, as an emergent property in, in terms of its, uh, its behavior, I wanted to remind everyone that 
Artificial intelligence can never match the real intelligence of a cell because, as Dennis Noble pointed out, our AI is based on silicon chips. But real intelligence of a cell is um, liquid-based. So within the fluid compartment of a cell, there are a trillion molecules that are trafficking, which is so tangled, naughty, and uh, impenetrably convoluted, it is worse than the London underground. So how does group behavior spontaneously arise from individuals? Well, I wanted to just give the example of starlings. Um, who hasn't uh, witnessed at some point in, or another this beautiful act of murmuration where thousands of starlings gather in flocks they're twisting, turning, sweeping, and swirling across the whole sky. Um, but it's a defensive movement, you know, against a predator usually. Why don't they bump into each other? It turns out that they only track the movement of the seven birds closest to them. Now, I have an office at Columbia University, which overlooks the great George Washington Bridge. And I have the pleasure of seeing a number of these traffic jams. If I start to think about what caused this traffic jam, it could be anything from an accident to a politician taking revenge upon a local politician. Uh, but how will it help to understand either the murmuration in starlings or a traffic jam by looking into um, a single bird's molecular genetics or a by under, trying to understand what caused this traffic jam by looking into the engine of one individual car or each car. The point I'm trying to make is that we have become so reductionist that we are not paying full attention to the complexity of biology. It's time that we really combine molecular biology with the biological and behavioral patterns of cells. Now, my contention, as uh, was pointed out earlier, is that we need to really think a bit differently instead of trying to always pursue that last cell to kill it. Let's go for early detection. And I want to remind everyone that I have been committed to this since uh, basically I came to the U.S. I started by studying acute myeloid leukemia. Before long, it was clear to me that in my lifetime, this disease will not be cured. So I turned my attention to pre-leukemia, which is myelodysplastic syndromes, hoping that would be an easier issue to resolve. Um, and the idea was we could intercept early. Now, uh, at this point, by 1984, I had become so committed to studying pre-leukemia and following these patients longitudinally as they uh, cross the trajectory of their natural history of the diseases. I decided to just save samples on my patients. So I started a tissue repository, which today has 60,000 samples saved from thousands of patients studied longitudinally as they go from pre-leukemia to leukemia or to die of complete bone marrow failure. So just reminded you that I have been committed to early detection for over three decades. Now, some people point out that sure, um, 60 to 70% of solid tumors, especially that are diagnosed, um, are non invasive and they can simply grow in place and size. But 30 to 40% are invasive right from the get go. I, I agree with that. But then, even for those, if they are diagnosed early, uh, nearly all cancers have effective treatments available, especially at early uh, stages. And I had the pleasure of uh, co-authoring this uh, piece with Joshua Offman from Grail, where we pointed out that you're looking at five cancers over here under the street light, whereas uh, we have early detection tests available. But then 70% of the deaths are occurring over there in the, in the dark where we're not even looking. So we are looking for early detection of breast cancer and someone is dying of ovarian cancer for which we are not looking. I wanted to just uh, remind you before going into the specific tests that um, when we think about the initiation of cancer, one of the very important things is polarity in a cell. A cell has an apical um, surface, a basal surface, and of course, lateral ones, and these are joined by gap and adherent and tight junctions. Uh, one of the first things that happens in the generation of the first cell 
uh, of cancer is that some kind of environmental stress leads to cell cycle stress, which ends up prolonging the S phase, but it doesn't enter mitosis. So this mitotic slippage leads to poly and euploidy. And now so much literature has come out uh, showing these giant polyploidal cancer cells or poly and euploid cancer cells, which um, do something very funny, which is that they flip uh, and do a self-afflicted uh, 90 degree turn and change their polarity. I want to show this to you, how two N cells then come out of that in a graphic way. So these are a row of normal cells. And suddenly, because of stress, the cell has now prolonged its S phase suddenly and becomes polyploidal. It just gets distorted in shape and does a, a 90 degree self-afflicted uh, turn. And that allows it, this, along with mitotic slippage, this change in morphology it allows also a change in mobility and it can actually start to move. And some of these first cell um, characteristics have been very well described. Now, these PACs and PG PGCC start circulating early and we can catch them. Uh, courtesy of Ken Pienta from Johns Hopkins, uh, who's done some beautiful work in PACs. Uh, you can see through these uh, markers, the presence of these cells, which we had ignored, or these uh, poly and cancer cells, which are circulating. These are prostate cancer cells that are in the blood that can be caught as the first cells. This I took PGCC uh, from um, uh, metastatic uh, breast cancer from the NCI album. And here is Jin Song Liu's work showing giant cancer cells, polyploidy, and then how two N cells can start streaming. So definitely we can uh, we can look look out for these cells. And somebody who's been doing that for almost two decades using the isolation by size of epithelial tumors from blood is Patrizia Patrolini. Uh, Professor Patrolini is in France and has this uh, wonderful uh, ISET methodology that she developed. This is a paper that was published in 2014. And I just want to take the example of this patient from the paper, 54 year old COPD, um, had a liquid biopsy through using the ISET technology of Professor Patrolini, and they found these circulating tumor microemboli. So sure, where is the cancer? They did a CAT scan, but no tumor is found in the lungs. They kept following the patient for several years. Four years later, the CT scan then showed a tumor. Complete resection was performed. It was a stage 1A cancer, and the patient has been completely cured since then. Eight, eight years later, the patient is still alive. So the point I'm making is some of these circulating cells can appear four years ahead of time. Here's a second example from Professor Patrolini, 66-year-old woman who was found to have circulating a microemboli again, these horrible looking giant cells. Now we don't know where they're coming from. They're just found in the, in the blood. So all kinds of tests have been performed uh, since 2017. So this is the fourth year now, and the patient is also under my care. We can't find a cancer anywhere. Can you imagine the amount of anxiety that the patient is facing right now? And what kind of protocol do we have to develop to guide us about what should be the next step if we find circulating tumor cells in someone. Should we be doing a PET scan or should we be looking for cell-free DNA or looking for it by cancer seek or methylation? The current paradigm for screening is that 1.3 million individuals between the age of 50 to 79 will be diagnosed with cancer. We spend $25 billion on screening and 9 million tests are positive, except that the actual cases out of those 9 million who have cancer, 206,000. So 8.7 million are false positives right now. So talk about overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Literally only 15% of the 1.3 million cancers we see today between that age group are being diagnosed early. We need to shift the paradigm and perhaps looking at it as a public health crisis where a dramatic increase in testing and detection is made possible. We need to transition from screening for individual cancers to screening individuals for multiple cancers. 
And of course, the cancer detection rate, which is the number diagnosed divided by the number of expected cancers, for breast cancer is 9% right now. For colon, it's 6%. So for all five cancers together, it's 16%. I'll give examples of a couple of uh, types of uh, liquid biopsies available. As you know, GRAIL is uh, front and center with their methylation analysis of circulating cell-free DNA, and they've published extensively. I don't need to go over all the details, but what they are finding is very high specificity with very low false positive rate, and the stage 1 to 3 sensitivity is 67%. With stage four, of course, practically all cancers can be diagnosed, 43% in all cancer types, literally, but much higher for stage four disease, where it's 92%. Uh, the tissue of origin was predicted in 96% of the samples, and it was accurate in 93%. So this is a great study. Um, I don't want to go into detail, but just look at what is possible with single tests and what would be possible by the multiple cancer early detection test. So it's a, it's really high. Thank you, Dr. Oz. Are you, uh, we, we've just got another minute here to get to the panel, so. Uh, okay, uh, so thanks. let me just uh, show the cancer seek is very similar that they found 26 cancers in, in 10,000 women, uh, but this was combined with, uh, of course, with the uh, PET scanning. Toshiba announced that they can detect 13 cancers in four hours. So what we are saying is that uh, basically we should be targeting a high risk population of patients, for example, those who survive one cancer at high risk of getting another cancer. What should we do when we find the first cancer? Well, as Henry Ford said, if I ask my customers what they want, they would say a faster horse. But we cannot fit a faster horseshoe on a car. So when we find the first cell, we can't basically eviscerate the abdomen. And this is where a new technology to treat patients comes in. And um, I don't have time to go and describe this wonderful patch technology, which is like a band-aid that can allow a spatio-temporal control of payload delivery based on a very dynamic feedback. So this is my last slide that I hope we can go cancer, which can uh, be detected from DNA markers, RNA markers, proteins, and metabolites in different compartments. Uh, we need to really align things properly for early detection, for definitive treatment, for and ultimately for prevention. So my uh, once again, uh, my uh, stress is that we should really uh, concentrate on finding the first cell and trying to prevent the disease. Thank you very much. A uh, patient must remain the measure of all things. Cancer is complicated, but we should find it early. Prevention is the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Raza. That was a wonderful talk and a great setup. Um, I'll just be making a few comments. I appreciate the early introduction. I'm Skip Burris, and I'm at Sarah Cannon in Nashville, Tennessee. As you see on the next slide, I've got a number of conflicts with the institution from clinical research that's being done. We're a clinical research Institute, and we emphasize very much early phase drug development. Those are many of the companies we work with. As you see on the next slide, and as Dr. Raza alluded to, cancer screening paradigms, I believe, are about to shift. The one test, one cancer approach, an example of low dose CTs here, where we know, in fact, that uh, there's been marked underutilization uh, of that technology, mammograms, I'll show you some data there, and colonoscopies. But in general, it's one test, one um, approach at a time, as opposed to the one test, many cancers approach, uh, which uh, Dr. Raz alluded to there with the technologies that are coming along. And could we, in fact, have a blood-based test that would lead to us being able to tell a patient whether, in fact, they needed additional workup to diagnose a cancer? As we see on the next slide, the early detection opportunity, simply put, early detection of cancer. Dr. Ross did a great job explaining that the earlier we find cancers, uh, stage one, uh, we're going to have better outcomes. Uh, all cancer staging is based on survival rates, and uh, the earlier we find it, the better patients are going to do. With regard to my population, I know my patients continually, and, and it's just been shown that it doesn't help to do scans after scans. Early detection of disease relapse or disease progression 
we are at 20 million cancer survivors in this country, and there are many of the worried, well, cancer survivors that are going to be interested in this technology. Uh, folks who finished high-risk adjuvant therapy for diseases like breast and colon cancer, those uh, men with elevated PSAs, a growing number of patients who've had their immunotherapy discontinued after a year or two and have had near-complete remissions uh, with melanoma, lung, renal cell carcinoma, and others. And then the minimal residual disease that's present. We know we have a number of hematologic malignancies as well as other disease entities where, in fact, we've rendered a patient at that point uh, relying on their immune system to keep them in check. But again, uh, a technology better than current imaging would certainly be an advantage. Strong family histories is a common question. Uh, you know, that's a group of patients that goes beyond the last bullet point, which is those where I diagnosed a genetic problem um, and could be do something other than uh, preventive surgery or the like that might in fact improve their outcomes. As we see on the next slide, the potential uh, challenges here, uh, we'll talk about this during the panel. Are there false positive tests or is the technology so good we're just too early to see it on our uh, workups? Overdiagnosis of non-lethal cancers. We'll want to talk about that. Are there situations where we'd be better off watching and waiting and now we've created a situation where we, a patient has a cancer that likely wouldn't uh, affect their lifespan or maybe their quality of life? Uh, improved health and survival due to screening, um, the lead time bias phenomena. Um, that's going to be something to talk about. And then how often would you do these tests? And then uh, our next panel will be talking about, you know, paying for these tests. Uh, certainly want it to be something in this age of talking about those that are, uh, you know, underrepresented and have uh, disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. How do we get those tested as well? My last slide here just highlights just some data that's preliminary. We're gathering this data now across our own network. This is the uh, effect on screening with the two most common techniques, mammography and colonoscopy, and that plunge is the pandemic. And you see that uh, very quickly over uh, a few months, we had a marked drop. Uh, we're starting to see a similar drop again as we've had the second surge. Um, and those curves haven't crossed back over the top. So we haven't caught up. We've, we're getting back to where we were baseline. But clearly, the vast majority of those people on that dip have simply elected to wait until next year. And that's just an example where a blood-based technology might be a better way uh, to, to get around this. It might be something that's a little more expeditious. So with that, I'd like to introduce the panel. Um, you heard Dr. Raz's uh, introduction, um, and again, uh, fabulous talk. We've all agreed we're going to go by first names as we know each other, so Azra will be part of the panel. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Otis Brawley, Otis best known for his greater than 10 years serving as the Chief Medical and Scientific Officer of the American Cancer Society. Currently, Otis is the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Oncology and Epidemiology at Johns Hopkins. And then uh, Dr. Lincoln Nadal. Lincoln is well known, certainly in my circles, for being an expert in the area of precision medicine, next generation sequencing, molecular profiling, and applying that to the cancer patients we take care of. He's the vice president and chief of precision health and genomics at Intermountain Healthcare. So welcome panelists. Um, and looking forward to a great discussion. So let me just jump right in. And uh, Otis, let me throw it to you first. Uh, you've talked some and written on the issues of overdiagnosis versus overtreatment um, and the impact as we begin to put these tests into play. So tell us a little bit about your optimism and your concerns about bringing this technology forward. Yeah, I'm very optimistic. Let me start off. But overdiagnosis is something many people are uncomfortable or don't understand. And that is that we have advanced our ability to diagnose cancer to the point that we are now finding some things that look like cancer, but they're not genomically programmed to grow, spread, and kill. And in certain diseases, thyroid, disease, thyroid cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, even lung cancer, a small proportion of the tumors that we find through imaging are actually tumors that don't need to be cured because they're of no threat to the patient. Now, the good news is, as we understand genomics better, uh, a number of our laboratory tests are now allowing us to, with more certainty, say, this is a tumor that needs to be treated 
this is a tumor that needs to be watched. The watched are the overdiagnosis tumors. But uh, especially in the 1990s with prostate cancer, we were very concerned that we were curing a number of men who didn't need to be cured of prostate cancer. They needed to be watched. Thank you. Very, very helpful. Um, Lincoln, a anything to add to that? Uh, any, any thoughts you have on that side of the, the equation? Uh, Otis brings up such a great point. You know, we're always concerned about uh, over-treating and, and diagnosing cancers that really don't need intervention. And then, of course, the flip side that we all understand as well is that there are many patients who don't get screening at all. You know, I'm, I work at a health system where we cover three and a half million lives and a significant percentage of those individuals live in rural locations where they don't have access to or choose not to pursue regular cancer screenings. And so they show up at our cancer centers or in our emergency rooms with advanced cancers that uh, will kill them and do kill them. And, and it's troubling, of course, for those individuals and, and their families. And it's frankly very expensive to take care of. So, you know, if we can have uh, a, a blood based cancer screening test that democratizes access to cancer care, if we can catch them early, we can save lives earlier. I know we all believe that. Um, uh, but that's the flip side of, of catching cancers that don't need treatment. We can also catch cancers uh, in places uh, where they're, we're not catching them currently. That's great. Azar, any thoughts? My thought, Skip, is that uh, first I would uh, always uh, give in to whatever Dr. Brawley is saying because oh. he's so... Uh, brilliantly um, eloquent and said it all. But my only uh, uh, addition would be that, yes, the older technologies were not helpful, uh, as helpful as they should have been. And that is why we need great investment in new sophisticated technologies and not just any one technology. We should be using everything available to us, including the Fitbit, and the cell phone and all kinds of dynamic measures. Stop testing one person once a year. Instead, we should be treating the human body like a machine and dynamically monitoring everything all the time. And this is what we should be aiming for. So I think uh, talking about old uh, technologies yielding uh, false positives, uh, those days should be behind us. So with the mention of the technology, Lincoln, let me let you start with uh, your confidence, your concerns about the tissue of origin, tumor of origin, when you, in fact, would get an early detection result back. Your confidence in that and, and your thoughts about getting a molecular profile and how it would be worked up. You know, uh, I've been the principal investigator on a study sponsored by Grail, and so uh, I have firsthand experience in using this technology, and um, it includes a tissue of origin prediction. And we detected um, many cancers in patients that had no symptoms at all uh, as part of that clinical trial, and the tissue of origin prediction was correct. Uh, you know, we followed up with uh, imaging and biopsies, and um, so I, I have uh, actually very high confidence in that tissue of origin prediction and our clinicians love it because uh, it gives them some guidance, some sense of what they're dealing with. Uh, so it's not just that um, you can detect cancers and predict where they're coming from. It actually guides you so that in subsequent diagnostic workup and, and diagnosis, you um, are, are more efficient. So, uh, I, you know, I think the data that have been published by the, the company sponsoring these tests are uh, strong data. They're believable and they're real. And um, I like that part of uh, of the whole liquid biopsy, you know, multi-cancer early detection uh, approach is this tissue of organ. So does you here in Lincoln talk there, do you feel like uh, the, so this result's going to come back to all sorts of people, family practitioners, internists, subspecialists, um, and then the, the workup that will start. Your thoughts about the, the tissue of uh, tumor of origin and, and how that will play out in practice? I am very optimistic for the future. I'm extremely optimistic. Uh, you know, as we this is the uh, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act. And the investment over the last 50 years in the development of genomics and genetic technologies is finally coming forth to bear fruit. And uh, I, you know, we really have redefined cancer. 
we've defined, cancer used to be just a slide that a pathologist looked at and said, it looks malignant. Now we're actually looking inside that slide, inside the cells and talking about what the intent of the genomics on that slide are. And so, yes, I'm very, very optimistic that we're using genetic and genomic technologies to not only figure out the things that look like cancer that truly are malignant, the non-overdiagnosis tumors, and looked at those tumors uh, with blood tests and other things to say, this is from lung, this is from ovary, this is from breast. So the sticky part of this um, that I hear in conversations is, and the emphasis is on the false positive rate. So the numbers that Dr. Raza showed, Aja showed fabulous test results, very, very low false positives in terms of percentages. But if we think about the population and we think about this being hundreds of thousands or millions of people, that'll be a, a few folks that would get a false positive. Do you think the technology is a false positive or you think it's just too early or when would you stop the workup and how would you handle that patient that you put through the, the, the workup and, and didn't find something? You're asking me? Yep. Yeah. Does you start uh, with that and then I'll go around the panel. I'll take a good Well, I think that research is still going to have to tell us that. Uh, the, uh, you know, there are going to be people like uh, Dr. Raza showed the individual who got the test annually for several years and then finally showed a lung cancer. You're going to have some people who are like that. And we're going to have to be patient and understand that. And, uh, you know, and the, the other issue is there are people who, uh, as Dr. Uh, Nadal said, don't get adequate treatment, be it screening, prevention, which is another element, or treatment. You know, when I was in Atlanta, uh, we actually documented that six to seven percent of black women, two to three percent of white women in Georgia who were diagnosed with early screen detected curable breast cancers got no treatment within the first year or so after diagnosis. So that's a societal problem as well. Great. Um, Azar, your thoughts, uh, false positive? Is it is it too early? Uh, how long, what would you do for the workup? How would you handle that patient? Yes, it's a real problem, Skip. And I want to ask you, because you are such a wonderful clinician yourself and have run so many trials and you are the president of ASCO at the moment. Are you going to help uh, the, the oncologists, the clinicians who are faced with these problems of uh, now these new emerging tests which are coming out? How do we handle, how do we form the guidelines? Shouldn't ASCO be having, instead of having more sessions on mouse models, shouldn't you be having some uh, sessions on how to deal with the problems that early detection is posing for us? And and the issues of false positivity, specificity, sensitivity, what, when to order, what tests, and uh, in what particular uh, order we should be doing them. I think uh, we need investment in at three levels. We need to invest in technology and scientific development. Uh, number two, we need to educate not just the public, but the oncologists also, as well as the patients, as well as basically... Um, education of everybody is needed. And thirdly, policy changes that have to come along. So I think we have a very steep climb ahead of us. But like Otis, I'm extremely um, optimistic because of the results we are seeing. As Lincoln pointed out, he's working already with Grail. And I have to also, uh, full disclosure, I have a research program going on with Grail also. Um, and the same way, Thrive and other companies that are producing such wonderful results, but they are also leaving us with many questions because the farther you go into the sea, the deeper it gets. Well put. And I, you know, as a clinician, I have talked about this. I firmly think our family practitioners, internists that, that get this test on a patient, and if they have a positive result, they're going to reach out to the oncologist to help them work through this. I think if I had a patient, I put them through what I thought was the, the appropriate workup, you know, I would, would maintain contact and, um, and repeat the test that, at a year and, and do an extra level, obviously not ordering a bunch of scans, but some, you know, uh, additional history and physical type work. Lincoln, let me get you to comment on 
you know, with next generation sequencing and the accuracy of these tests and just the technology, the methylation uh, that that's being utilized, um, you think it's a false positive or just is it just too early? And how do you think that will be handled in your community? You know, I was wondering about this when we started our trial. We actually had a patient who ended up with a positive signal and um, a cancer was not detected. And we have debated whether that's truly a false positive. But what I have learned is that our primary care physicians are actually more worried about false negatives. Uh, they're worried about missing cancers in patients. So uh, th this test actually uh, tests like this, just the general topic of multi-cancer early detection is being uh, warmly received so far by our primary care docs because the, their current sensitivity for detecting a pancreatic cancer on physical exam is zero. They, they don't detect them. And so, you know, having a test, a blood-based test that has a 50, 60, 70% sensitivity is a dramatic improvement over their current uh, ability to detect those. So, uh, and the other thing is that it completely changes their conversation with patients. Our state right now is 49th in the nation in adherence to screening mammograms. Our, our population just doesn't go do it. You know, they're busy and they don't want to take time off work or from their families and uh, so having a, a blood-based test that you can get when you go for a, an annual wellness exam and you don't have to drive in to a screening center that has mammography, uh, that really changes the conversation. So uh, we, we're excited about using standard screening methods in combination with these multi-cancer uh, early detection tests, these blood-based tests, and together colonoscopies, mammographies, Blood-based tests, we think, is going to is going to change the way we're able to detect cancer in our population. So, Lincoln, you made a comment there about the annual exam. So, is, do you think that's it? So, you got the the mammographies every year. You know, people get through their colonoscopy and they feel great about ten years. Um, people being what they are. So, we'll get back to costs later. But cost aside, uh, is it something you'd want with your annual exam? This is we, we've debated about this. I'm excited to hear what Azra and Otis have to say. <laughs> We, we're not sure what the right interval is. I personally would, would do it uh, annually. Uh, I would like to have that kind of peace of mind is nice. But, you know, that's what we're going to figure out as we integrate this technology is what is the right, uh, what is the right interval? What is the right application? And we're excited to not let perfection impede progress uh, and just start implementing and using it. And we'll figure it out as we go. Asher, you're going to want it yearly when you, when you get your... Check out. Yes, I think that's a very good idea, Skip, because even just getting uh, for adults who are between 50 to 79 years of age who get annual exams, if we just add one, te one simple test uh, that can look for multiple cancers, for example, the Grail test can look for 50 cancers, Toshiba can look for 12 cancers, uh, Cancer Seek uh, is able to look for 13 or so cancers. I think just adding that one blood test would dramatically increase the percentage of people we are detecting early. And right now, those single tests that I showed have 15% uh, cancers picked by mammography or 6% by colonoscopy. That is a really low number. I would love to hear what Otis has to say about this also. Well, I yeah, Otis, Otis, and Otis, when you're uh, so two things: one, you're going to do it yearly, and then let's roll into uh, you know from there, continue the conversation. I want this last thing to sort of be about who's going to mm -hmm. get this? Like, is it the worried? Is it going to be doctor pressure? I mean, you know, so how are we going to get people to uptake this? And um, and sure. and you published some on deaths averted, and you published some on the impact, you know, the congressional, the congressional legislation is interesting because we're going to have to be able to show the, the it's worth the money, right, mm -hmm. to, to get this sort of thing done. So start out with what you're going to do and then how are we going to apply this to society? Sure. I think we're going to have to take some data and put it in some mathematical modeling and figure out how often to offer these tests. It may very well be every three years is best. And I say that because one of the things I worried about when I was at the American Cancer Society was I began realizing we're saying people should get colon cancer screening routinely and everybody wants to get colonoscopy. There's not enough GI docs in Montana, North Dakota and South Dakota to do a colonoscopy every 10 years on everybody over the age of 50. So we're gonna to have to look at some mathematical modeling for these newer blood tests 
uh, and when these blood tests are FDA approved. And it may be every year, maybe every three years, maybe every five years. Then we're also going to have to worry about how we're going to get it out to the entire population and not just a small group of people. That's awesome. Uh, and just before I go to Lincoln, your your comments about deaths averted with early with early detection. What do you think the numbers are? Actually, that's been calculated for a couple of diseases. For example, in uh, breast cancer, of the 45,000 or so women who are going to die from breast cancer this year, uh, about 20% could have been saved if they had gotten effective treatment after diagnosis. And about 10% uh, are going to die because of a failure to get some type of screening. Uh, so uh, in breast cancer, it's well known. In colon cancer, colon cancer has the potential of reducing the risk of death by 35%. Uh, that probably means that uh, we can save 15 to 20,000 people a, a year in addition right now. Uh, if we had really good colon cancer screening throughout the entire country uh, with uh, lung cancer screening, that's been calculated as well. Lung cancer screening with spiral CT for people at high risk for lung cancer due to smoking. We could save about 10,000 lives a year, but lung cancer screening has a curveball to it. The, the diagnostics actually do have a death rate associated with them as well. So we'd save about 10,000 lives and we'd lose about 1,500. We'd net 8,500 lives saved. Yeah, that's so helpful. And um, as you said that, I was thinking about as I've gone through my 30 years of practice, and it used to be, gee whiz, a 35-year-old with breast cancer, and then that became routine. And then uh, over the 10 years ago, it was, oh my gosh, a 40-year-old with colon cancer. And sadly, in the clinic today, that's routine. Um, yeah. So that that is just a sad state that now it's not too shocking to see young people with these cancers. So Lincoln, um, you're rolling off of what Otis's comments, your thoughts about getting people to do this and how would you, would you, would you roll it out and thoughts about how to, to justify the, the means for the ends in terms of getting it paid for and covered and getting doctors to order it? You know, we anticipate rolling this out to our primary care um, clinics and having them offer it on a regular interval in uh, at, at regular wellness visits. The debate about cost is a big one. It's a very important one. One challenge is that the, a test like this doesn't replace something. So you don't, it's just an addition currently. And so a very superficial analysis would say, well, we're just adding cost. But a more thoughtful analysis would argue that, in fact, if we add a test like this and we catch cancers earlier and, that, and we're curing them, not only are we, are we extending lives, but it's actually a lot cheaper to deal with a stage one or stage two cancer than it is to manage a stage four cancer patient with all of the expensive uh, accompanying therapies. So we just have to do the heavy lifting, the hard work to prove that that's true. And, and I think the payers will get on board, but I, I also think they want to see that data. Yeah, you're right. I, that's a well done point. I mean, just, you know, the with the effectiveness and, and still not curing people, but the effectiveness of the armamentarium for stage four disease, you know, patients are taking $10,000 a month plus treatments for a year or two. Um, and so you're right, that, that's a huge cost to think about. So we've got some great questions coming in from the audience. I'm going to flip to those. And uh, Azra, I'm going to let you take the first one. These are all tough ones, but uh, it feels like you probably have got the, the best thinking about how we're going to shift things like the NCI budget from the drug development mechanism of cancer biology to thinking about prevention and detection? God, somebody has been uh, reading my mind, I think. And that's from uh, Sa Sana Ralph, so, you know, not surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Skip, and thank you for whoever asked that question. Um, uh, first, I'd like to say that, look, when there is a word processor, who's going to worry about a typewriter? No one. Yeah. We, once we have something new that comes out, it's going to replace the uh, obsolete things which are so uh, difficult anyway. Now, the second thing is that I want to imagine a radically different future, not the same kind of uh, incremental improvements of 2% and 5%, but radically different future means that in the very near future, in the next, within the next decade is my prediction, every individual will be surrounded, as Dr. Leroy Hood says, 
with billions of uh, data points uh, in a cloud surrounding the individual with dynamic um, um, analysis of these uh, uh, these data points and feedback in a very timely fashion about uh, whenever there are disease perturbed networks detected before the actual disease becomes clinically apparent. So I think that monitoring wellness to diagnose illness is such an important concept. We know cancer is hugely complicated. We are not, uh, for all the wonderful research and advances in understanding the biology, I started by showing you how little it has helped patients with advanced diseases. We need to take the blinders off and realize once and for all that advanced disease is tough to treat and we are using draconian measures to treat them even when we pat ourselves on the back all the time about wonderful immune therapies, whole industries are arising just to control the side effects of those immune therapies like CAR T's, for example. So the point I want to make is these should all be enough to put pressure on the government that they need to think about investing in early detection more than 5% of their budget, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. uh, Otis, Otis, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Roll with that. Yeah. Uh, close to that. Well, first off, the National Cancer Act of 1971 actually established a prevention budget at the NCI, and there is a division of cancer prevention. They've told us an awful lot. We actually know about half of all cancers are caused by energy imbalance, which includes obesity, too many calories, and not enough exercise and smoking. Uh, we know how to prevent a lot of cancers. And as an epidemiologist, I would point out that we know that because college-educated Americans have a much lower cancer rate than non-college-educated Americans. So what I would actually do is not, uh, I hate to say this, not put more money into prevention research at the NCI. I would get every American a health coach to teach them how to live a healthful life that lowers one's risk of getting cancer and try to implement some of what we've learned over the last 50 years about cancer prevention. Interesting, yep, education, um, so, so vital. Lincoln, um, any comments about that? And then I want you to roll to, I'm gonna try to summarize a lot of audience questions into some groups, but anything you wanna add about that would be great, but then take it into, um, does he, does this need to be the an FDA approved test? Does this uh, people from the audience wanting to know, you know, bad test as bad as a bad drug? Where do we need to regulate this sort of testing? Just to conclude the previous conversation, I think the social determinants of health, as Otis was alluding to, um, are critical. Uh, you know, so addressing uh, addressing access to health, addressing access to cancer screenings is going to do more than the most sophisticated therapies we have for uh, finally when patients show up with advanced cancer. So I, I applaud the general notion of having blood-based cancer screening tests because that is how you eliminate many of these social barriers uh, that uh, prevent patients from getting um, their regular screenings. Now, in terms of oversight of these kinds of tests, I do think that uh, FDA needs to be involved. And my understanding is that they are. I think all of the companies that are developing the, these technologies have been in conversation with FDA. Some of them have uh, early uh, breakthrough designations and things like that. So I think the, the public wants to know that the uh, oversight body to ensure safety in drugs and, and diagnostics is involved and it currently is and should continue to be. All right, fabulous. Are there any, any thoughts about that oversight of the tests and uh, standards to be met? No, not really about that. I do think though that uh, what uh, Dr. Brawley pointed out uh, about the NCI investing in prevention, this is one of my pet peeves, Otis, that prevention and early detection have been kind of lumped together. Yeah, that's and true. And they should, uh, and anything I'm saying is not to the exclusion of what you are saying, because you are absolutely right. A healthy living is a, is a great thing to teach everybody. The problem is that people with the most pristine lifestyles also get cancer. And they get it at a young age also. 
And my daughter's best friend, whose story I wrote at 22, gets this horrendous glioblastoma multiforme. What kind of horrible things did this poor boy do to deserve this cancer? Yeah, we are so. failing our patients. We should realize it. And yes, all this talk about healthy living and great lifestyles is wonderful, but cancer will occur in everybody, no matter what their lifestyle. Yeah, one in two men, one in three women. So, Otis, let me go to you first. Tough question, but I want everybody to comment on. There's a number of folks asking about, you know, do we just continue adding this to mammography, add it to colonoscopy, add it to lung cancer screening? Could it stand alone? Uh, so, Otis, put that in the frame of if you were going to do a couple studies to really tell the world that this is worthwhile doing, um, how might you approach that? Well, I would... Uh... Uh, first, I would like to try to get everybody into a program of screening. Not we, we so frequently talk about get a mammogram or get a colonoscopy. I want people in a program of screening for all cancers where they go to the same place and all their data is kept in one place as to what things they're getting. And then we do a series of uh, cohort studies where we follow large cohorts of people who are in a program of screening to actually demonstrate how many cancers are found, how many deaths are averted. Excellent. Lincoln, any thoughts about that? Well, I, I really agree with Otis. You know, we see therapies that are approved uh, after just phase two data is generated. And then those, those, those companies have the responsibility to generate additional safety data and report on that. And I would love to see something similar. You know, when we're convinced that uh, the test is uh, repeatable and reliable, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm convinced of that now, I think we should implement it. And then we can, in real time, uh, collect the uh, outcomes from those individuals and, and really report on um, you know, the, the false positive rates and the number of can uh, cancers detected at earlier stages. I think that's gonna be very eye-opening when we talk about downstaging cancers. And, and the number of lives saved. So I would love to see it get approved and implemented and then additional data reported as it's used in real time. Yeah, well said. The uh, It's interesting, I think uh, many of our educated audience probably know, but eagerly watching the STRIVE study that Grail sponsored, about 100,000 women getting mammograms and we participated, um, you know, really interesting to add this test on the mammography and really a broad-based population. And you know, we're going to find other cancers and other issues beyond breast cancer that come in that population. So great denominator, 100,000 women that are in that age, and uh, that'll be a study in and of itself. Um, Osra, anything study-wise you'd want to see done, uh, any population, uh, you know, particularly when you look at your blood cancer background, anything you'd like to see explored specifically in that area? Well, for me, very interesting proposition is uh, who is at high risk of getting cancer, really? And like I tried to point out, but it was a rush thing at the end of my talk, that the people who are at high risk are those who have survived one cancer. My own husband is the best example. At 34 years of age, he got one deadly cancer, survives it. At 57, he gets another and dies, a horrible death. So first of all, the reason people keep getting more than one cancer is because we haven't changed the protoplasm of the body. Whatever made them susceptible to one is still there. And secondly, we aggravate the situation by the treatments that we are giving to people also. So I do think that the high risk group should be looked at very carefully immediately. Cancer survivors, MD Anderson alone sees 80,000 cancer survivors a year. Why aren't we taking a simple blood test on those people and looking for early detection of cancer? Because that's one population that you can really find a lot of cancers in. 20% of new cancers diagnosed, 20%, one in five, are in a cancer survivor. In yeah, 19... I, I, I love that. I love that thought. I made the comment about the patients that come in the clinic who benefited from therapies and are in remission. But um, as you were talking, I have had two HER2 positive breast cancer patients that I treated 10, 12 years ago. Um, you know, they would have passed away 25 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, they heard two breaths, so great, excited, great remissions, and die of ovarian cancer. Two women get ovarian cancer 10 years later, go through two or three years of treatment and pass away. And uh, that story's 
far too uh, far too common. So that that's a great group to look at. There are certainly that that's a group too that's you know the the most educated about the problem. Yeah, so we've just got a few minutes. Oh yes, go ahead. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. I was saying in 1996 I had established the Time Center in Chicago, therapy induced malignancy evaluation, and saves uh, blood samples on survivors, thousands of them. Uh, that's another story I tell in my book. I don't want to go into it, but it's not an old uh, new concept. It is. It has been the idea has been there, but we need to implement these things now. Okay, that's awesome. So um, I'm going to go around one time. We've got a great panel We're at the top of the hour. A great panel coming up next. Um, but one minute each. Let me go, Otis Lincoln and Azra to finish uh, one minute of comment, uh, Otis, anything you want to tell our audience? Yeah, I worry a great deal about getting everything that we currently know to everybody. Uh, when I was at the American Cancer Society, Stacy Federer and I, who's Stacy's coming up later, did a study uh, with a bunch of other folks to show that about 120 to 130,000 of the 600,000 deaths that occur every year would not occur if every American got everything that we currently know, to include prevention, adequate screening and diagnosis, and adequate treatment. Now, I do think that these blood screening tests as an adjuvant added on to current screening that people should be getting would actually save a lot more lives. But let's remember, there's a lot of people in the United States who don't get adequate treatment today. Fabulous. Lincoln? I just think it's thrilling to be working at a time when these kinds of technologies are becoming available. Uh, the pace of innovation in cancer care is unlike anything we've experienced before. Uh, not only uh, therapies for advanced cancer, but also early cancer detection like those we've been discussing today. It's amazing. Uh, patients have a better chance of doing well today than they ever have. Uh, that being said, a, a critical component of this will be making sure that we implement it the right way. Patients still have to get their current cancer screening test. We can't say, well, you got this blood-based test so you don't need a mammogram. That's not true. Same with colonoscopies, uh, same with pap smears and all these other standard tests that we have. So uh, we've we got to do it the right way so that we can continue to justify utilization of these kinds of novel technologies. Well, said. thank you. Great, great, great words of advice. And Azra, final thought? Thank you, Skip. My final thought is that we must bring the patient back front and center into every conversation about this disease. We must look at everything in the cancer paradigm through the prism of human anguish. What are our patients and their families going through? It is a dreadful disease. So I will simply end by quoting Emily Dickinson because how important it is that we not increase the anxieties of our patients, but try to alleviate uh, the pain that they're feeling. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. Like lightning to the children, eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. Perfect. Well, I'm not going to try to top that. I will just thank uh, Azra, Lincoln, Otis for your words of wisdom. I know the audience enjoyed it. Great segue into our next panel. I'll just finish out this segment by saying, you know, for my 30 years as an oncologist, early detection has been what we've been hoping for. And now it's here in front of us and it's, our obligation to figure out how best to utilize it and how to incorporate it to, to do all the things that the panelists have talked about. So with that, our next session, the value of early detection, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Darius Lakdawalla. Dr. Uh, Lakdawalla is the Director of Research at the USC Schaefer Center. And with that, I will turn it over to Darius. Thanks um, for a fascinating discussion and thanks to the panelists. Uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, Dana, Ruth, and the Aspen Institute for uh, having me today. Um, I'm going to begin with a few brief remarks, and then I'm going to introduce uh, our uh, fantastic panelists for this segment of um, the talk. 
what I'm going to talk about is the question of what's the value of early detection of uh, cancer. Let me begin with uh, some work that um, uh, Dana Goldman and I did with a number of colleagues almost a decade ago, where we showed that uh, the U.S. experienced greater post-diagnosis cancer survival gains than uh, countries in Europe. Even though we started out at a higher baseline, um, we gained an extra half a year. Uh, in, in addition, this was not just an artifact of overdiagnosis or diagnosing uh, cases earlier, as you can see from here, because in fact, there was a decline in the uh, rate of people dying from cancer as well in the United States that was more rapid than in other OECD countries. So typically economists don't specialize in delivering good news, but I think there's a lot of good news to be had here. Uh, and these trends had a number of uh, contributing and complementary causes. And you can see that uh, in this slide where I have the United States in red and a number of other comparable European countries in darker colors, and it shows you cancer incidents. Um, the point that I want to emphasize here is that uh, the, the players have changed, but the result has remained the same over this long period of time that over the first part of the century, of, of the initial decade of the century, there was a substantial decline in cancer incidence within the United States. We were doing fantastically well on prevention, and that contributed to our falling mortality rates. Unfortunately, that uh, prevention trend um, receded and even turned around somewhat uh, around 2008, but we still continued to experience declines in mortality rates. So this suggests that a number of factors have helped to keep mortality rates falling in the United States. It's likely that we've had better prevention. You can see that uh, over this period of falling incidents. It's likely that we've had improvements in uh, treatment outcomes because even in situation, even in periods where we had rising incidents, uh, we see falling mortality rates. Now, better treatment outcomes have a number of sources on their own. There, of course, we can have better treatments, period. But detecting cancer earlier, as has been emphasized, I think, quite eloquently, is an important ingredient in better treatment outcomes, simply because it's easier to get a good outcome when you detect cancer earlier. So this is, an, this is a useful introduction to our panel, which is about the value of earlier detection, but it's useful to note that there's a backdrop here of progress along a variety of fronts, and there's a lot of good news, even though there are certainly a number of problems to resolve. But one question is, what has been contributing to the declines in mortality? And one way of looking at this is that Mortality rates have been decreasing faster for some tumors than others, and this is just this is U.S. data to uh, focus the discussion a little bit. So I've put up uh, a number of cancers um, for a comparison here, and we might ask ourselves why the difference in these cancer trends. You can see that, for instance, lung cancer has a truly remarkable decline of almost 40% in mortality rates from 2000 until 2018 breast, colorectal, uh, and cervical cancer also so show significant declines. Uh, pancreatic and esophageal cancer, mortality rates have been relatively flat, unfortunately, um, whereas ovarian cancer rate, death rates are falling too. So there's a heterogeneous mix here. How can we make sense of it? Well, lung cancer is, an, is a, a positive outlier here, and smoking cessation has played a big role. Uh, probably not the only role, particularly in recent years where there's been a lot of treatment innovation. Uh, but the falling death rates uh, for men in, in particular uh, from lung cancer coincide with reductions in smoking uh, for the affected cohorts. So this is a story of success for prevention. And uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Razan noted, there's no substitute for fantastic prevention. It makes all of our it makes all of our statistics look better, uh, because the easiest way to save a life from cancer is not to create a case of cancer in the first place. But what of the other tumor types on this figure? Well, let me start by noting that uh, I think, as has been noted previously, uh, that we do screen for cancer, but we don't screen for that many cancers yet. Um, so here's a table showing 
uh, what the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommends regarding the quality of evidence in favor of different cancer screening modalities. So you can see that these are all A and B grades that uh, we've put in this table. Um, breast, cervical, colorectal uh, are probably the most widespread um, examples. The lung cancer screening recommendation here is pretty narrowly defined uh, for a 30-pack year smoking history, which is quite heavy smoking behavior. Nonetheless, it's, it is a recommendation with a B grade. Uh, but it, what, if, what happens if we focus on uh, the cancers that, we, that have a screening technology today? It's worth noting that this leaves unserved a vast uh, number of cancer deaths. And I believe uh, Dr. Raza noted this earlier as well, that um, roughly 70% of deaths from cancer are taking place in tumors that do not have routine screening technologies available. But if we look at the cancers that do have it, can we make some inferences about what the value of routine screening can be? <laughs> One thing to note is, it's quite simple, that if you just look at the three uh, cancers with screening modalities available, they certainly seem to be doing the best um, over this 20-year period. So breast, colorectal, and cervical cancer, mortality rates are falling rapidly. Ovarian cancer is, of the three other non-screen tumors, where non-screen just means that there's no routine screening for asymptomatic people that's in common practice. Ovarian cancer is kind of the exception that proves the rule because ovarian cancer has benefited from a number of salutary uh, prevention effects. That w there's evidence that oral contraception, for example, reduces the risk of ovarian cancer. And as cohorts of women who were first exposed to oral contraceptives in the, in the 1960s um, age into cohorts at higher risk of ovarian cancer, we're gonna see that benefit. Um, and so we've been fortunate in that sense. But the experiences of pancreatic and esophageal cancer uh, suggest to us the difficulties, the challenges of trying to reduce uh, cancer mortality for diseases where uh, it's very, very difficult to detect early and so many cancer cases are detected in late stages where treatment options are much more limited. And to make this point a little more uh, specific and to dig in a bit, if you look at our three routinely screened tumors, we're doing quite well at picking up cancers early. We can always do better, but the blue bar shows you the fraction of cases, incident cases that are picked up in localized stages. The green bar is regionalized and the orange bar is uh, metastatic. And certainly uh, it, will, it would be of enormous health, public health value to reduce the height of the green and orange bars. But it's worth noting that a plurality of cases uh, for all three of these cancers are, are detected in localized stages. And, and that's in sharp contrast to esophageal, pancreatic, and ovarian cancers, sort of the three comparators we've, I've chosen here, uh, where the plurality, in fact, is metastatic, where the treatment options are more limited and prospects are uh, not quite as bright. So in thinking about what would be the implication of this uh, more generally, you can see that screen amenable cancers show higher five-year survival rates uh, across the board. So breast, cervix, colon, substantially higher than our three uh, comparator cancers. Um, and to be clear, there are numerous factors that drive cancer survival rates. Uh, but it's difficult to escape the conclusion from a, for a variety of reasons that early detection matters. We certainly know that it's easier to treat cancer earlier. We know that the efficacy of treatments uh, applied earlier tends to be higher than the efficacy of treatments applied later. And we know that cancers that show higher rates of detection early seem to show higher, better outcomes as well. In fact, if you just did one simple thing and you asked the question, what would happen if we took those three uh, comparator non-screen cancers and just shifted their rates of uh, early detection to make them look like colorectal, breast, and, and cervical cancer? What would happen to their mortality rates if you just did that one thing? And it turns out you'd close about half or more of the survival advantage um, that screen tumors enjoy. So the rate of early detection seems quite have, uh, strongly correlated 
with uh, survival advantages for the tumors we're looking at here. And this is only the beginning of what might happen because uh, there are a num number of positive knock-on effects when you detect cancer earlier. The more early stage cases there are, uh, the greater the returns are for innovating in the treatment of patients at earlier stages as well. Um, so the ultimate effect would likely be even bigger than this. And as has been noted, uh, we're on the cusp of important breakthroughs in screening. There are there have been great advances uh, in the analysis of cell-free DNA, um, and I will not pretend to uh, provide any expertise over and above our distinguished first panel here. Uh, but you can see that there are more than a half dozen uh, potential tests in the pipeline with significant effectiveness at um, at catching cancer early and effectively. I want to call your attention to a couple of things here. One is that um, uh, the specificity of, of these tests is quite high indeed uh, for the most part. Um, so meaning uh, that the, the rates of false positives are quite low. Uh, so for instance, uh, if you look at um, uh, mammography, uh, the rate of false positives actually are higher than uh, what you'd see for a number of these tests, uh, which is very encouraging news indeed. Of course, it's also true that uh, for blood-based tests, sensitivity also tends to be a bit lower, particularly for the multi-cancer blood-based tests. And it sort of makes sense. If you're trying to detect a wide range of cancers, then um, it's more likely that uh, you will miss some cancers and, and produce some false negatives. But I think this reinforces a point that was made earlier, which is these tests are to be regarded as an and, not an or. That This is a supplement to existing screening technologies. And the question is how best to fold these in to our arsenal of screening technologies. Um, and we're going to grapple with that question uh, today on the panel um, as we discuss the role of both new technologies and traditional approaches um, in detecting cancer uh, earlier and more effectively. I do want to point out that invariably new technologies bring challenges for access. And, and here's a way of thinking about it is this simple figure. If you look at racial disparities in early diagnosis, you might look at that pancreatic figure and see well, you know, there's basically no racial disparity in the detection of pancreatic cancer early. And if you're a glass half full kind of person, you might say, well, that's that's kind of good news. But the reality is that glass is really, really small and doesn't have much stuff in it because the the low, the low lack of disparity in early detection for pancreatic cancer uh, is a consequence of there not really being um, sufficient technologies or strategies to diagnose pancreatic cancer early. This is kind of the double-edged sword of new technology in healthcare, that it tends to, to lift average outcomes, but it also could expose us to more inequality. And, and you see that with the comparison to breast cancer, where you do see, uh, in this case, racial inequality, that there's a significant um, a black-white gap in early diagnosis rates. Um, we've done better in recent years uh, to, to narrow this gap, but it's still not acceptable that that um, ca early cases are about 15% lower, or the rate of early detection is about 15% lower for African-American women than white women. Um, so the question is, how do we encourage new technologies um, that will improve average outcomes, yet also not exacerbate the underlying inequality in our healthcare systems? How do we promote broad and equal access? And that is not simply a technological issue. It's an issue of delivery system reform, reimbursement reform, and coming together with new technologies. And, and the time is ripe for this discussion. Uh, in his introductory remarks, Dana mentioned this, that just last week, in fact, one week ago today, there was a bill introduced um, that uh, grapples with the question of or recommends uh, uh, Medicare coverage of multi-cancer screening tests. So the time is right for a discussion of, about reimbursement, although I would emphasize that it's not only about reimbursement, it's about delivery system, uh, delivery systems that also provide better access to care. And uh, from that um, launching point, it's my pleasure to introduce our three panelists today. Um, who will help us navigate uh, this set of issues. 
So let me introduce them briefly now. The full, I won't do justice to their credentials, but let me do something quick. Um, Dr. Stacy Fidoa is an epidemiologist and senior principal scientist in the screening and risk factors surveillance team within the data sciences department at the American Cancer Society. Uh, she's responsible for uh, cancer screening and early detection research, and uh, she examines disparities in access to cancer screening and the quality of it. She also examines how health policies and public health recommendations influence screening utilization and early detection. Welcome, Stacy. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Dr. Lee Newcomer, who's currently at Lee Newcomer Consulting, spends his time creating new approaches to make cancer care more effective and affordable. Um, Dr. Newcomer spent the majority of his career with United Health Group, where he served as the chief medical officer from 1991 to 2001. Um, he, he returned in 2006 to lead an initiative combining clinical, financial, and program management experts to focus on cancer care. Before his work at United Health, Dr. Newcomer was also a practicing oncologist, and he served as a medical director for uh, Cigna as a founding executive of Vivius, a consumer-directed venture to allow consumers to create their own personalized health plans. Welcome, Lee. It's great to have you on the panel as well. Um, and last... Uh, Dr. Josh Offman is the Chief Medical Officer uh, and External Affairs at GRAIL. And uh, by the way, Dana asked me to point out that he serves as a member of GRAIL's Scientific Advisory Board. Um, Josh also serves on the Board of Directors of CellBT, Inc., an immunotherapy company focused on the discovery and development of innovative cancer therapeutics. Previously, Josh spent more than 15 years at Amgen, where most recently he was the Senior Vice President of Global Health Policy. And before that, Josh was a faculty member at UCLA, where we won't hold that against him, at least not too much, as well as Cedar sinai and uh, as a senior vice president of Zinc's Health, a subsidiary of Cerner. So welcome, Josh, and thanks for joining us today as well. Sure. It's off by allowing each of you to uh, make some opening remarks on the question of early detection, its value to patients and to society more generally. Um, so uh, maybe Stacy will begin with you. Sure. Um, so as um, Darius mentioned, um, my background in research examines the use of currently um, recommended cancer screening. So I'm kind of viewing what we're talking about in that framework um, and how we might face some of the same barriers that we have with existing technologies with applying new technologies. Um, so one of my thoughts about this talk was just the number of cancer screenings that um, people have to undergo. Um, right now we have cancer screening tests for four um, types of cancer. Um, three of them have long been recommended and continuously recommended for breast, colorectal, um, and cervical cancer. And even though that these um, cancer screening tests have been long recommended, not one of them met the Healthy People 2020 goal, or at least we're not on track to um, reached that goal using 2018 data. And I think um, given the declines in cancer screening during the COVID pandemic, we certainly won't reach them. Although um, in one of our studies that we published last year, among women age 50 to 65 who are eligible for three types of cancer screening tests, about nine in 10 were up to date with at least one of them, but only four in 10 were up to date with all three. So on one hand, um, the percentage of up to date with all three three is pretty dismal, but on the other hand, it's nice to know that at least nine in 10 women had at least one type of cancer screening test. So perhaps um, if we streamline cancer screening or we're able to only have one test, which I know we're not there yet, it could overcome um, the number of hurdles to cancer screening. Um, and my second point is just the number of hurdles that people with lower socioeconomic status have to jump through. Um, to get screening is greater. So screening is a multi-step process. Um, it starts with people usually having insurance. From there, they have to find a place that will take their coverage. Um, then they have to have a provider recommend it, and then they actually have to get the test. Um, and because we don't have an organized screening program that's largely left up to the individual, um, along with some health system um, help. And we know that there has been gains in insurance coverage with the Affordable Care Act, but 12 states have not yet expanded Medicaid. We know that people who live in states that expanded Medicaid have um, not only better cancer screening uptake, but they have improved at a faster rate. 
Um, another barrier that comes to mind is that there's 48 million people who are eligible for screening but don't have paid sick leave. Um, and they're less likely to have seen a doctor. So I think a lot of the previous discussion was talking about primary care and that role. But if people aren't seeing their doctor and they're not seeing their doctor because of paid sick leave, um, there's no pol federal policy for paid sick leave that's um, problematic. So um, I know I've identified a lot of um, challenges that we can talk about. Um, I'm curious to hear um, what the other panelists think. Thank you. Thanks, Stacy. Uh, Lee, over to you. So I'll be a little bit controversial and say maybe I'm going to ask for unequal access. And, and let me tell you what I mean by that, though, before people run off and start tweeting. Um, I, I think key point here is that um, if you take a health plan like my former employer with 15 to 20 million people who would be eligible for this test, and let's say that test is $1,000. That's, I don't, no price has been set yet anywhere, but you hear ranges 500 to 1,000. It's a pretty serious investment. To double the number of cancer patients you detect, you would find twice as many as you are today with standard screening, but still a lot of money and not that many patients when you get right down to it. So what's missing, I think, in this discussion is a way to get out of the medical system and to step ahead of it to actually, um, if possible, create a what I'll call a funnel test. Is there a way that we could, with very simple measures and perhaps one biologic specimen, reach out to people in their homes, find out what their cancer risk potential is, and identify the high-risk individuals who would benefit from very rigorous screening programs custom-tailored to them? So there may be a lot of people out there who who could actually decrease their cancer screening quite safely, and others who could, who should be doing uh, a large increase in screening. I'll give you a specific example. Um, I'm on the board of a diagnostics company. We do the BRCA testing, but we also developed an algorithm using about 100 SNPs, a few simple clinical questions. And with that, we can give a woman, regardless of her ethnicity, a percentage risk of cancer, of breast cancer for her lifetime. Now, doesn't matter, you could be BRCA negative as most women are, but if the SNP test shows that you have a lifetime risk of 70%, I would argue you'd wanna see a surgeon or at least be doing mammography very often. Um, on the other hand, if your risk is 5%, you might wanna actually decrease your mammography. Now, that test isn't the kind, it, it's a very narrow window but if we could find those kinds of screening tests for multiple cancers, we could then identify people who would really benefit from the kinds of technologies we're talking about today. And that would be, by definition, a smaller number. Really important. Because I think we have to pay attention to costs. In all honesty, as I do the back of the envelope calculations, if you're screening millions of people every year, the number of people you pick up at an early stage to save late stage treatments, it's not going to pay for itself. You'll, you'll be expending more money. And we may decide that's just fine, but it will be an added cost to a health system that's pretty strained already. So final thought, this pandemic may teach us what we can drop. We have a lot of people not getting certain kinds of elective care. And they made you just fine. So why don't we take a good look at the data that's going to come out of this pandemic and say, let's quit doing X and we could put more money in future cancer profession at the same time. So lessons to be learned from COVID. I, I do think, though, the other lesson is we should find a way to do this first screening outside the, the healthcare system. It's too strained. Another thing we've learned from COVID. Um, I have a 95-year-old mother-in-law who's at home in her apartment, not in the nursing home. I can't figure out how to get her her COVID vaccine because she doesn't fit inside the standard criteria of the medical system. This is going to be the same problem. If we have to screen every single individual over 50, we've got to find a different mechanism other than the healthcare system for those people to get access. Thanks, Lee, for those uh, thought-provoking points. Josh, do you want to go next? Thank you, Dora. So maybe just clarify something, Lee. I think um, Lee is talking about um, risk-based tests, which are, are different than screening tests. So I just don't want people to Absolutely. get confused yeah. about that. Those are those are not screening tests for cancer. They're they're tests that discriminate risk. And the best risk discriminators we know today are things like age, 
obviously those over the age of 50 are about 13 times higher, have a higher incidence of cancer. And, and there are other risk factors like smoking. And the, but the, these risk-based tests could play a very important role, but they're not screening tests. So Darius, my main point is, you know, we've been fighting a war against cancer for decades, and it is not a war we're winning. And, and you heard the earlier panel talk about this. And we're suffering from kind of a classic streetlight problem where we have four or five existing screening tests today, and we're looking for those under the light where the light is available. But all the deaths are happening over there in the dark. About 70 to 80 percent of the cancer deaths are occurring in cancers that we are not looking for at all. And as you uh, rightly pointed out, the opportunity um, to improve early detection there is enormous. And what could the public health benefits be of that? And, and we need to talk about that. We have some information about that as well. So the big idea here is how do you transition? How do you make a paradigm shift to screening individual, screening for individual cancers, one organ, one cancer at a time, to screening individuals for all their possible cancers? And to do that, uh, David Alquist wrote a very eloquent paper many years ago about um, aggregating prevalence. How do you use aggregate prevalence across all these cancer types to dramatically improve the predictive value of an early detection test? So for mammograms, for example, for every 100 positive mammograms, only about four or five women will end up having breast cancer. Mm -hmm. For every positive uh, 100 positive stool-based colorectal cancer screening tests, only about three or four of them will end up having colon cancer. And with these multi-cancer early detection tests, I'll, I'll only speak about GRILS because we look at 50 or more cancers. You know, we're talking about an order of magnitude better, a, a predictive value of somewhere between 40 to 50 percent. Um, so it provides this incredible opportunity. And um, to seize that opportunity, a lot, a lot has to change. We have to think differently about what matters. And I think Dr. Raza stated it, which is, you know, the traditional metrics like single cancer screening tests trying to maximize sensitivity, right? Let's not miss anything, but let's accept a 11% false positive rate because we're only looking in the breast. Uh, you can't do that in a multi-cancer setting. What you wanna do is optimize a very low false positive rate. So you need the false positive rate to be less than 1%. And then you wanna optimize the overall cancer detection rate in the population because the only hope we have to really make a dent in the cancer mortality curve, and cancer is about to become the number one killer of men and women worldwide, the only chance is to dramatically improve the cancer detection rate in the population. And if we can do that with simple blood-based tests that look at genomic features, because cancer is a disease of the genome, and do it while minimizing harms, okay, low false positives, and not finding cancers that are indolent and not going to kill people. Um, and we dramatically improve the cancer detection rate. And again, as Dr. Raza mentioned, we could go from 15% of cancers in the population to over 50%. That's the best chance we have to make a dent in the mortality curve in cancer. There's a, this has been modeled out now to your earlier point, Darius. And these early models, which are in press now, suggest that this could result in a by Detect, intercepting about 70% of cancers at an earlier stage, it could potentially avert up to 39% of the expected cancer deaths, which equates to about 100,000 deaths averted every year. And just to put that number in perspective, that's about the same magnitude as everything we throw at cancer today. You know, radiation, surgery, treatment, diagnostics, molecular, everything is resulting in about us averting 100,000 deaths a year. So. The potential is enormous. And I think the challenge for groups you know, brought together here is to figure out how do you realize that potential? Terrific, thank you, Josh. Um, so let me, uh, I'd like to begin our discussion kind of at a high level with, by linking back to a theme that came out of the earlier panel. Um, I think Dr. Brawley mentioned, made the point that what's needed here is, this, is not just to talk about individual screening technologies or individual tumors, uh, but instead to talk about a screening program for not just individual patients, but for populations of patients. And, and each of you has a different perspective on that challenge of how to develop a screening program that works for our society. Stacy, I might start with you on this and ask you maybe to talk a little bit about 
What do you think is the role of delivery system reform, primary care, kind of the foundations of how we uh, detect cancer in the population? Um, what steps do we need to take there in order to build out this I, this vision of a screening program for every American? So first, the U, in the U.S., we call it opportunistic screening. Um, in in uh, Europe, they actually do have organized screening programs. And within the U.S., Kaiser has, um, Kaiser, the HMO that's um, popular in so, so Southern and Northern California do have screening programs. So I think you can kind of look to them to see what it would look like um, within an integrated health system and kind of learn from their examples. Um, they have... Um, a robust electronic medical re- medical system, like electronic um, health systems, as well as reminders. So they really support the physicians in recommending these cancer screenings. Compared to if you're a physician at a really busy community health center or a QHC, you might not have that time or those reminders and all those support systems. So I think we need to better support the actual health systems, especially where lower income people receive care. So I think that's you know, one thing. And then I, I talked about that. I, I kind of talked about just general health care reform um, in my talk and just ensuring access to care for people um, who don't have insurance or have Medicaid insurance. Um, we know that there's barriers to people receiving uh, cancer screening who do have Medicaid insurance. Some states still don't cover lung cancer screening for their Medicaid populations. Um, so I think there's just at each level, I think we need to address the the hurdles and the barriers that exist. Thanks, Stacey. And Lee, um, I know I'm gonna we, we should talk a little a little bit later about the issues of reimbursement you raised around new technologies, but I wonder if we could start with the question of from a reimbursement perspective, um, how do we uh, best pay for um, the build out of of holistic screening programs for the American population. Clearly, they have, they have both costs and benefits, and it's inappropriate to talk only about the costs in isolation. So that's not quite what I'm asking here. But in your view, uh, what's the right way to finance and to encourage financially with the right incentives, screening programs for patients and providers? Well, I'll still come back to my original comment, and that is we may need to get it out of the medical system. That we may need to make things incredibly easy to do to get screened. So why should a woman have to go to a primary care to get the order to go get a mammogram when she knows that every year or two years, depending on her risk, she needs to get one? Why not just have be able to present your health plan card right at the mammography center when it's convenient for you and you finally got the two kids away at school and you know you've got a free hour, then you can go do it. Uh, But instead, we make people jump through the medical system hoops. And if we're talking about the potential to have a blood screening test, why couldn't I have that blood drawn at Walgreens when I'm in picking up a prescription rather than, again, accessing through a variety of healthcare systems? So if if we want to get serious about programs, we're going to have to expand beyond the healthcare system. And we've got all the major health plans uh, today and, and most of the state blues all are under high incentives from NCQA screening to show that they're doing mammograms and pap smears and colonoscopies. They are sending reminders constantly. There are phone banks at most of these health plans calling people to help them make their appointment for their colonoscopy. And yet we have abysmally low rates. Um, A lot of that is because you're asking people to take two days out of their life, and that's not what they want to do. This is why the, the, the liquid screening looks so fantastic because that would be a much better way to be screened for colon cancer than to go through a, a rigorous procedure. So I think, I think part of this solution uh, for a systemized program is going to be one, belonging to an organization that's going to track for you, whether that's a health plan, whether that's a Kaiser Permanente or an Intermountain, whether it's uh, even a government agency, but somebody who will help you remind you, here's what you do for, but then make that access incredibly easy because it's not today. Thanks, Lee. Uh, really interesting points. And, and Josh, I know you would agree that we no longer live in an era where the job of the innovator or manufacturer is just to push their product or device or test as widely as possible. It's to figure out how to appropriately 
uh, create value for patients um, in society. And so that seems to strike the same kind of theme that we've been discussing here. What, what do you think is the role of Grail and um, the innovators more generally in building out the screening program and introducing new technologies into that ecosystem in a way that promotes value for patients? That's a great question. Lee, Lee makes two really important points that, that I'll restate to, to kick off my comments. First is that um, you know when the new technology enters, like these blood-based multi-cancer detection tests, they're going to require an investment. They're not going to save money uh, right off the bat. There is a view to where they could save money because as sequencing costs have come down, they're already now affordable. And at the right, you know, as soon as sequencing costs come down more, there is potential that they could, in fact, be cost neutral or one day cost saving. So there's line of sight to that, but that's not going to be the case right now. And, and that's a really important point. The other point Lee makes that's really critical is um, how do we make it seamless? Like, like the same arguments around value-based healthcare. How do we make the things that are of high value really seamless for people to get? And maybe it's getting it out of the healthcare system, but there are other solutions. I think blood-based testing provides a whole new set of opportunities to um, either increase overall compliance with screening, to have the blood-based test bring other screening tests along with it, and getting it in a programmatic format that makes good sense. What's, what we do know, though, Darius, is based on everything we're seeing, we are not going to single cancer screen our way out of this problem. Too many cancers are simply being detected too late, even among the screened cancers. And there is no way it will ever be cost effective to screen for each of these un, you know, rare, uncommon cancers, one cancer at a time. And so if we really want to tackle this problem, we have to begin to embrace this idea of multi-cancer early detection. And to Lee's point and points made in the earlier session, we have to find ways of uh, making those very accessible uh, to individuals to not only close the disparities in cancer screening, but to just drive much better cancer detection rates in the population. In terms of value, you know, this will clearly be, we've, we've you know, run the numbers, these will be highly cost-effective interventions, but that does not mean they're saving money um, right off the bat, okay? But from a value perspective, they will be uh, of much higher value than cancer therapeutics for the most part, and they'll be on par uh, with value, if not better, than the most of the single cancer screening tests. But we have to embrace a new paradigm or we're just not gonna make a huge amount of progress. Thank you. That, well, so I want to bring together a couple of points that have been made and that, that intrigue me. Um, Lee, you, you emphasized the need for convenience, and, and Josh, you emphasized the need for access, and Stacy, you emphasized you know, the need for this to be embedded into the fabric of the healthcare system almost. The, the tension that I see that we have to navigate is, I love all those points, but then there's the question of if we also want to make sure that uh, resources are being used in their highest value means, someone ha has to function as a gatekeeper, either implicitly or explicitly. And gatekeeping is always a thankless task, and, and no one's ever perfect, and it creates all kinds of access issues. So I wonder if the three of you could would mind wrestling with me, or not with me, but with that question, uh, and uh, talk a little bit about how can we balance this challenge of convenience and access and widespread use and also this need to make sure that we're targeting to value. Darius, are you, are you asking, in effect, um, where should we target the utilization? Because uh, to Lee's earlier point, if we can find the population that's at elevated risk, whether it's because we know they're at elevated risk because they're over the age of 50, or they have a strong family history, or to Osra's point, they're a cancer survivor, or to Lee's point, we've done some genetic test on them to know that they're at increased risk. If we can target the test to those at elevated risk, obviously the value goes up because the prevalence of cancer and the incidence will be higher. So Josh, and I therefore, think that in addition, I, I, yes to that. And in addition, I'm interested in a, a, the related question of who would be doing the targeting and how do we do the targeting? Those, I think, mm -hmm. would be really interesting to discuss. Maybe you, you want to take the first stab at it? Well, sure. So here's here's the what we need to do. And, and I've been thinking a lot about this. We know a few things but you know, in a single cancer screening world, uh, we look for risk factors for single cancer. So we know a lot about the risk factors for breast cancer, 
We know a lot about risk, for, risk factors for colon cancer. We know something about risk factors for pancreatic cancer. You know, you're diabetic, you have a pseudocyst or esophageal cancer, smoking for head and neck, HPV for certain cancers. So we know a lot about the risk of certain cancers. We know very little about the risk for any cancer. Okay, so we know that smoking increases your risk for about 15 different cancers. We know that obesity to, uh, increases your risk for many different kinds of cancers. But the level of granularity about that level of risk knowledge is low. And so there's a lot of, now that we're in a multi-cancer uh, framework where we have multiple companies, Grail, Thrive Early Detection, other companies working in this space, there's gonna be a huge effort now to better understand the risk for all the cancers, right? Because that's what we need to get to now and we do not have that those data readily available. But the good news is we know that people over the age of 50 have a 13% higher incidence of cancer when looked across the board. We know that smoking and cancer survivorship puts you at risk for many, many different kinds of cancer. And we know obesity, diabetes, and other basic things that are easy to learn about people put you at risk for many types of cancer. So we'll have to use that as our guideposts for now. But I know the American Cancer Society and other people who are sitting on large data sets are now looking at what are the real risk factors for multiple cancers so we can get a finer, a finer look at that. Thanks, Josh. I actually, I actually think your, your health plan is the one with the strongest incentive to be a gatekeeper, Darius, as we're, as we're looking at this. Um, you know, ultimately, they would love to see more members without cancer, and they'd love to see the testing go to the people where it's going to be really effective. So all those incentives are there. And I know from experience with, uh, gosh, one large national health plan that I happen to know, <clears throat> they're looking very hard at how can we look at real world data to find patients who would be of more benefit. So they've already taken the the uh, criteria from the NCCN to see who should be in low dose CT scanning. And through modification from their real world, real world data and their data sets, they've been able to improve that risk by about 10 percentage points. And I think that's the kind of work that you'll see going on at the places Josh mentioned and in health plans who have data capabilities to try and keep finding the population that ought to be uh, screened and and monitored. Now, how they monitor, uh, given today, somehow it's going to be an app. Somebody's going to bug you with a text. Um, but that, that part, I think, is quite solvable. We've got lots of people doing that already for a variety of things. Um, I get notified that I have to pay my utility bill or else. And you can do the same with, with your screening procedures. Thank you. Stacy. Um, so first of all, I, I, I'm, um, I was thinking about how each one of them, each one of us is thinking about gatekeeping. I keep talking about the health system and the gatekeeper. Um, Lee has just said, okay, we're going to forget that. We're going to have the a consumer be their own gatekeeper and they can get screening um, wherever wherever it's convenient for them. Um, and then Josh has been talking kind of about like technology being, you know, removing that gatekeeper with technology. So I think it's interesting that we're all kind of seeing different um, gatekeepers. I'm kind of existing in the past um, a little bit <laughs> trying to figure out how we're going to use the existing structures we have for the future. Um, so that, that's kind of like where my, my background and research is in. So this is such an interesting question that I don't have an answer to. Like if we're moving forward, do we try to just rewrite everything or are we trying to work within the structures and the systems that we have in place and trying to make them better? Um, so you know, I, there's one other, one other point to Stacy's point to mm -hmm. that is kind of interesting is that these new, this new generation of multi-cancer tests are based on uh, genomic features and genomic signatures and, and often have machine learning uh, algorithms that are, that learn. And so one of the other functions that is going to happen as we roll out these tests is we're going to learn a huge amount uh, by looking at real world, actual real world data. And those data are going to then continue to teach these machine learning algorithms how to get more and more refined. And I think to Lee's point, that's one way we're going to learn, even without having all the risk prediction available that we need, we will learn which populations are getting the greatest value from this early detection technology because we're going to keep teaching our algorithms uh, how to get better and we're going to keep looking at real world data over time because we have the need to do that. So that's just something different about machine learning oriented testing 
as opposed to just traditional diagnostic testing. Terrific. Thank you. And it's, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left and we have a number of interesting questions from the audience that I want to open up. Uh, well, first of all, a couple of uh, straightforward uh, questions that I'm going to pose. When do we expect uh, these tests to become approved by the FDA? Josh, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so uh, we, and I know uh, a couple other companies are in breakthrough designations with the FDA, which means, you know, we have the opportunity to iterate quickly. But, you know, the FDA has not reviewed tests like this before. Um, it's definitely breaking new ground. And there are a lot of um, differences between these, you know, multi-omic or pattern recognition type tests compared to the single analyte traditional diagnostics that need to be worked through and the evidence needs to be generated. So I would suspect within a couple of years, we're going to see these, uh, these FDA uh, submissions being reviewed and, and hopefully approved uh, expeditiously. In the meantime, you know, uh, many of these diagnostic tests, uh, most genetic diagnostic tests are, are uh, in the market as lab developed tests for some period of time. Even the best ones, I know Myriad is one and uh, foundation medicine were LDTs for many years before they ended up with an FDA approval. So that's likely also uh, going to be seen here in this field of multi-cancer early detection as well. And our, our test, for example, um, you know, uh, we're thinking that there's potential for it to be uh, commercialized at some time in 2021 um, while we're still working with the FDA uh, on that on that broader approval. Terrific. And, and uh just continuing on in the uh, life cycle of these technologies, a number of people have asked about payment. And, and there are a couple of dimensions I'd like to ask about. One is, do you think payers will cover these technologies? And if so, how and for whom, which relates back to this question of to targeting and such. And the other related question is about Medicare in particular. Um, given that there's a Medicare bill pending, um, what, what do we think about um, having a specific legislative reimbursement requirement, which is a little unusual um, for Medicare. So you can take any or all of those questions. Maybe I'll start with you, Lee, on this one. Well, um, I'm going to start with a general statement that I never really like legislative approaches to um, medicine. So having, been, having said that, however, though, CMS doesn't cover preventive services. And so unless it is approved by the United States Preventive Services Task Force, whose criteria are are much broad, much more, uh, what's the right word? Restrictive, I'm going to use that word. Um, they probably have an orientation to uh, complete, exact, infallible tests. And we're talking here instead about screening to capture people at early stages, which means you're going to have some loss of sensitivity. And, and it doesn't fit into the algorithms or the paradigms that you, the United States Preventive Test Services uses. So the reason for perhaps considering the law is to create a new category of benefit for CMS, that may make sense. But you're gonna have a host of issues that I hope don't get to the legislative arena, pricing, uh, cr specific criteria for the test, et cetera. That, that's something that you shouldn't ask your senator to do. And if you don't believe that, talk to your senator for just a couple of minutes and you'll get it straightened out pretty fast. Um, I think payers are going to be really slow in this. Um, they, you are going to have a substantial increase in their uh, budgets. They're all uncertain right now about what's going to happen post-COVID as people rebound back into health care. And, and you don't end up saying no to all the uh, current screening that you have today, these two, these tests are complementary. And I keep coming back to those payers and saying, you know, you are doubling the number of cancer patients you're finding. That is a significant benefit. And perhaps mostly in Medicare Advantage, people may begin to use that as a selling point. Thank you. Stacy or Josh, any thoughts on reimbursement? Stacy, go ahead. Oh, I don't have a whole lot to add um, from what Lee said, but, you know, the traditional avenue is through the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Um, so, again, it's to Lee's point, I, lo I love the way that you guys are thinking about this. Like, I'm kind of just going through, like, the road that we have been traveling, um, and you're kind of thinking about different avenues, including legislation, which sounds like you, you aren't necessarily in support of, but that is an option, um, at least for Medicare beneficiaries. Um, 
Well, maybe, Darius, one, one thing just to clarify for everybody on the audience, the history of cancer screening in Medicare has been entirely legislative. The only reason Medicare pays for pap smears, uh, mammograms, colorectal cancer screening, and po prostate cancer screening is, to Lee's point, they do not have coverage authority. So specific legislation has been enacted in each one of those individual cases to enable Medicare to provide that type of screening. So I'm actually quite encouraged that stakeholders in DC who are broadly trying to modernize Medicare um, across a lot of dimensions, right? They're very active in DC. Medicare itself has uh, just put out a proposed rule about uh, advanced diagnostic tests um, that they should be covered upon FDA approval if they're in a breakthrough designation. And now lawmakers are putting forward legislative efforts to modernize Medicare more broadly. The fact that they focus this particular piece of legislation on multi-cancer early detection is terrific, but it's, it's a part of a broader movement to just modernize Medicare. And unfortunately, uh, because Medicare does not have a benefit category for screening tests, legislation may in fact be required. Now, Medicare itself is trying to do something about that through coverage with evidence development and through this new uh, uh, Medicare coverage of innovative technology proposed rule that could get, get us part of the way there. So I think I'm very encouraged by what I'm seeing uh, through the stakeholders, including legislators in, in DC. Um, and in terms of payers, I think Lee made an important point. Payers like Medicare Advantage plans or ACOs or capitated environments where they keep patients for a long time, particularly those at elevated risk like Medicare beneficiaries, the value uh, for them to adopt multi-cancer early detection tests is gonna be quite high. And I think they're probably gonna be the early adopters and that the standard commercial plans are gonna be slower. I, I agree completely with Lee. But I think as the evidence mounts and you know the demand uh, is growing, I think commercial payers will start to understand that if used in the right populations where the budget impact is manageable, they're gonna get a lot of value out of this because the life years gained, um, you know, it, the life extension that we could see could be pretty dramatic. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm going to uh, take that. Darius, Go ahead, Lee. Please. I'm going to just add one comment. I agree with all of that. I think the, the thing that's going to be tough for that legislation is it's got to be scored by CBO and um, the Congressional Budget Office. And that's going to be really tough right now, given the amount of data that we have about outcomes. Um, so big hurdle to get over, even though yeah. all the things that Josh just talked about are very important for getting this coverage. It is absolutely truly. And I'll, I'll just say that one thing that COVID has taught us, which I think is very applicable here, and you mentioned it in terms of the bar that, you know, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is terrific. But if you look at cancer screening, these have been 10 to 20 year journeys for each one of them with government sponsored trials to get this USPSTF approval. Uh, you know, I, we've talked to a lot of Medicare beneficiaries. I don't think they think they have 10 to 20 years to wait for technology that we have today that can find cancer in people that don't know they have cancer. Um, and what COVID taught us is that maybe there is a way of thinking about public health oriented testing that's different than the way the FDA has traditionally been thinking about testing. And uh, I think Michael Minna at Harvard has written quite eloquently about this. And maybe it does require a little bit of a different way of thinking about public health testing as opposed to you know, the perfect testing. And uh, if we can dramatically increase the cancer detection rate, like increasing COVID detection um, with simpler tests that are widely accessible, but may not have that same performance, we'd be doing the public health a good service, I think. Well, on that optimistic note, uh, I think it's, it's uh, time to thank our panelists. We really appreciate um, uh, all of your time today. So thanks very much to uh, uh, Stacy Fidoa, Lee Newcomer, and Josh Offman. Thanks for joining us. I also want to thank the clinical panelists from uh, earlier, including uh, Skip Burris, Otis Brawley, um, Dr. Nadal, and especially Dr. Raza for her inspiring keynote remarks. So on behalf of the Aspen Institute and uh, the USC Schaefer Center, thanks very much for joining us today and uh, have a wonderful evening.